Um, break. Welcome to Mohe with Jenny Park, a new series where I sit down with people I care about, people who inspire me, and have conversations. For those who don't know, Mohe is a Korean word that translates to what are you up to? What are you doing? And it's one of my favorite words because it's so playful and it opens up connections. So right now I'm focusing on friendship. So I'm excited today to have one of my close friends, Neka Anzarike, join me. Neka, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we met back in 2014, right out of college at General Mills. It was our first job in marketing. We happened to be on the same floor in 3BT, became friends. And then since then, I moved to California, you're in Boston. But I wanted to get a snapshot of your life and where you are right now, Neka. Like, what are you doing? What are you up to? What's making you happy right now? So I am in Boston. I'm in Cambridge, technically, Massachusetts. And I'm on a leave of absence from grad school. So I'm in this joint master's in public policy MBA program at Harvard. And then last year, decided to take a leave of absence due to the pandemic, as well as other opportunities that came about. So now I'm doing a bunch of work with cities uh with minneapolis and chicago and just working in equity and racial justice space so you and i became friends at mills and we were just like getting coffee together getting lunches which i feel like is normal like for work friends people can relate but what do you think made us be from work friends to real friends i'm trying to think about like when that actually happened like yeah. when we became real friends because i think we did a lot of like we obviously saw each other at work we worked on the same floor. We got lunch together, like you said. And then I think we started to hang out a little bit outside of work. So we were like kind of testing the waters there. I don't remember either, but I do know that I feel like when we would meet at work, our conversations just became different. Like it wasn't just about our weekends. I don't know, or it just felt like comfortable. Like it wasn't small talk. But I also feel like you're kind of, and maybe we both are kind of like that where you kind of transition out of the small talk pretty quickly. And so yeah. I think that was part of it, that I think there are people that like I worked with and like I was friends with at the time that it kind of always stayed in that, like what you did over the weekend, what are your hobbies type of conversation. What's your favorite music genre? <laughs> yeah. And I feel like too, like you were like, I mean, you still are, but like really spiritual and like really like, you know, invested in your religious community. And I feel like there was something there that I was really, intrigued by but kind of connected to in a way and i think there i feel like we've had a lot of conversations where like my writing has been mm -hmm. like my spiritual my spiritual practice and my spiritual community and we would be talking about the same thing and you would talk about it from like what you learned in small groups and like what you learned at church and i would talk about it from like going to a poetry reading and like being in a writing fellowship but we were talking about the same things just in different spaces so i think we had that connection like a spiritual connection like really self-reflective maybe yeah Do you, is that like what is one memory you have from our friendship then like is that something that sticks out well i remember i think there was like so much intimacy too right and like inviting someone into that part of your life because i feel like for most people not that it's a private thing but it's a special thing right and so for me to like invite you to like a poetry reading or to like I'm reading for the first time like about my life and like I was writing a lot of memoir at the time and that was like very like sacred to me and you invited me to like your small group and I remember being like oh that's like kind of a big deal to invite me into this. I actually can't believe you came. And then I came. I feel like I remember being like, duh, I'll go. I think I just was nervous about like committing to going every week, but I was just like, I'll go. And everyone there was so welcoming. And then you invited me to church on Easter. I rem And then we like went out to Easter brunch. So like those moments, and I think it's one thing to talk to someone about like these sacred parts of your life. And it's another thing to like invite them to come into it with you, right? And I think that's when we started to like cross into another part of our friendship. Do you feel like you have a certain friend type that you're you're drawn to? I don't know. I feel like I'm almost like kind of curious to think to ask you if you think I have a friend type because I feel like I don't know that I notice what the like through line is of all my friends. I think everyone is creative. I think people who just want to move and make things that move people is like what I'm drawn to. I think I'm drawn to funny people in general <laughs> or people who can appreciate humor. As opposed to boring people. As opposed to boring people, actually. Got it. 
And I mean, I think it's, I think there is a spirituality thing now that, I, now that we've named that I'm drawn to people who value or who feel spiritual in their own way. And I think that's how we move into that deep conversation thing, which I feel like is also a Scorpio thing. Let's just get, let's just get into it. For your birthday party when it was on Zoom and there was like 15 or 20 people and I could see like a lot of the people in your life, personalities really ranged. I noticed that. Interests really ranged. I mean, everyone was like down, like everyone's like friendly and like cool and like wants to like talk and connect. But you're right that I did get a sense that people want to talk about substantial things. Uh, I don't know if that's true because we also talked about Kim Kardashian. <laughs> but know, just, like, and like that new Ivy Park drop. I feel like, which I think is maybe it. It's like, let's be able to like go deep and talk about the real shit and also pull out and just like talk about random, funny, irrelevant, random stuff. So yeah. Yeah. So in my memory, there are two inflection points in our friendship that I feel like propelled us to like be closer. One of them was like our very first confrontation. Probably our only confrontation, right? Uh, I think so, which is, I guess, yeah. It, I mean, it was a pretty big, confrontation feels like such an interesting word. I guess it was a confrontation. What would you call it? A standoff? I don't know. All right, that's a word, like maybe a heart to heart? Well, I mean, I feel like confrontation feels like very much in the moment. And I think that was very much not an in the moment thing. It was like a drawn out, <laughs> like standoff. Okay, so context for the, the fight. We were obviously real friends. The fight, I don't know what we're called, the standoff. We were friends. I genuinely don't remember what happened. I A part of me, and maybe this is just when I confronted you about it, but I feel like it had something to do with work. Like, I feel like you got something at work and I didn't congratulate you. It had to do with work. Oh, I'm cringing. Yeah, I remember I was hurt at you about something. Like I felt like, oh, Naga doesn't care about me because something. And then I pass was a passive aggressive to you for a while. And then for some reason we texted where it, it came out. I think I just straight up, oh uh, yeah, maybe it did just come out. I, a part of me, maybe this is my revisionist history, Thinks that I just straight up asked you, Jenny, what the hell? Why are you ignoring me? I mean, maybe in a softer language or maybe not, actually. And I was like, yeah, remember that thing you did two months ago? I'm like pretty upset. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. So then we went into Panera and we met up. And, and then it was also like a huge buildup, right? Of like, okay, we're going to have a moment and a day and a meeting to like talk this through. But I think it was part of the fact that we had like lost a trust or there was a, I don't know, something had been broken. So Ooh, like, that's so true. A trust <laughs> felt broken in that moment. But it honestly got stronger because of it. Because I think that was the first time for me where I felt like I was communicating my, I don't know, needs to you. Because it wasn't about like, I need an apology from you. And that's not what I needed. It was like, I need to understand that you do care about me and care about our friendship. Yeah. So then when I kept saying some, like, and I look back and I'm like, this is not nice, but I kept saying to you, like, I think you're like not very emotional or you're not emotional. So it must mean that you just can't, you just don't care about me and my emotions. And you are like, you need to stop saying this. <laughs> Yeah, because then it started to hurt me. And I think it was like, one, I feel like it was triggering because I've heard that before from close friends of like, you have no emotions and you're emotionless. And I feel like there's just was something there where I was just like, it, it felt like you weren't seeing me. And it felt like you weren't seeing my humanity of like, of course, I have emotions. Of course, I'm mm. impacted by things. Of course, I get hurt. Of course, I care about people. Or else I wouldn't be in a Panera parking lot, sitting with you, eating my like leftover broccoli cheddar soup in the car at like 6 p.m. Um, and so it's just hard. It takes a lot of courage to like tell someone that you love and care about that you hurt me. And I'm nervous that this is a sign of our friendship, right? And I think that's what you were trying to communicate that not only were you hurt by it, but you felt like this must be more telling about the state of our friendship than anything. And that's the part that is hurtful. Yeah, because I think unlike a relationship, like we never had a 
like defining what our friendship was. So in my head, I'm like, oh, Neka and I are getting close. And then it's this first thing that happens where I'm like, maybe we're not like, maybe like we're actually just work friends and I have higher expectations. And so I think I felt insecure too, and to yeah. not want to bring it up and then be upset at you also that you couldn't tell and like, think about I don't know I don't know what it was and then it was beautiful because I feel like we just jumped right back into it and I think obviously got closer but I remember after going to the parking lot I do think we got froyo or something and then we went back to your apartment and then Eugene walks in and it's just like oh you guys are friends again and I'm like uh yes Eugene we are but it was like we were just hanging out on your couch I think that is a good tell of our friendship that we've always also been able to weave in and out of like this heavy or not even heavy serious thing yeah. and then be like okay now we're over it and like let's go do something else <laughs> very much you though too like I think I'm not I think I'm someone who kind of holds grudges and I'm working on like <laughs> you know when the harm has been repaired actually just moving forward but I feel like you're very good about like this is what happened this is what I need and once you get what you need you're like great Let's move on. So, you know what's interesting is mm -hmm. that for a while I thought I was an Enneagram 7. And if I am an Enneagram 7, one of the things is that their biggest fear is like pain and sadness. And they avoid conflict and hard conversations. Mm -hmm. But And so when they're in it, they care less about actually like hashing it out and more about like quickly getting to the resolution and like the feel good. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if it's like my like strength of being able to like forgive and get over, pass on. But it's just like I don't – I can't sit in – pain frustration I just want to be like oh thank god we're good we're getting good like let's let's quickly move on and get out of that place again because <laughs> I think my emotional capacity cannot handle it that's real I mean it sounds like both a strength and I guess a opportunity ah uh, yes an opportunity yeah <laughs> okay the second inflection of our friendship was last year during COVID and we were facetiming and I forgot, I think we were just like catching up and whatnot. One thing I do really love about you, Neka, and I don't know if you know this or if people told you, is that even if we hadn't talked for a few months and we were catching up, you, I sometimes feel like I'm lazy to explain all the details of my life. So I'm just going to say like, whatever, this happened, whatever. But you give me such a, maybe it's because you're a storyteller, a full picture of your whole life that I know every character, every detail of like every moment. And I feel like I didn't miss a single beat of your life in those three months. <laughs> no, that's real. And I feel like every time I'm like, let me just quickly catch you up on this thing. It'll take five minutes. And then it's like an hour and a half later. And I'm like, oh my God, that was not supposed to be that long. But I feel like I do like that. Like, I, I mean, I feel like that's like the, especially long distance, the part of friendship that you missed is like all that texture and like all the highs and lows. And sometimes when you're catching up with people, you just give them like the resolution. And I'm like, I wanna know the emotional highs and lows. I need to know all the characters, what happened? Now, what are you thinking? And like, don't, no spoilers, don't give it away. Like, I need all of that. Dude, that's why you're a freaking storyteller. I can't wait for you to write a movie. Same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the inflection point was we were FaceTiming whatever and I was just like on this friendship kick because I probably had just read uh, Big Friendship and the book was a lot about like societal norms between like friendships and whatever whatnot. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to ask you these intentional questions, which you were the only person that I <laughs> asked this to for whatever reason. But I asked you something I like, heard. yeah, it, it, it was such a fruitful conversation. I was going to say, and really tender. Like, I think that is part of, like, friendship, too, when you, like, invite people into these really vulnerable, like, new territories. There is, like, a tenderness that I feel like you held that conversation with that I really appreciated. And I love that you responded well to it and you didn't just laugh at me. But I asked you, you probably did laugh at me. Um, <laughs> I asked you, like, what are your expectations of me? Which sounds really weird coming out of my mouth. And then I asked you something like, what do you love? <laughs> it is weird, right? I mean, it's not, it's beautiful. But in the moment, I was just like, I mean, I think I did laugh at you and be like, Jenny, what the hell is this? And then I was like, okay, let's play. I'm down. Yeah, that's true. And then I asked like, what do you love about our friendship? And what can you not do in our friendship? Was that the third one? Well, one, I remember being like really caught off guard and shook. <laughs> like, whoa. I've never had to reflect on that within a friendship before. And I don't even think I've ever really defined what friendship means to me in a way that I feel like I've defined what do I want a romantic 
partner, a romantic relationship to be for me. I think I said something like really like shallow and basic. And then you're like, okay, here's my answer. And like, it was clear that you had thought through it. And you basically opened up about like, oh, I feel like we don't, we have these catch ups and we don't, you know, which is always like past tense. And we are not really like present tense friends, you know, we're not like in the moment, this is what's happening to me. And I want to be like, I want to call you more and talk to you more and all of that. And I was just like, oh, yeah, I felt that way for a long time too, but I've never done anything about it. <laughs> and so, so yeah, that was the first one. And then the third one was something like, what is something that you want to do in our friendship that you can't? And I can never mm. remember how it was phrased, but it was it made me go there. I hesitated to answer. And then I was like, I feel like I can't always talk about my blackness in this friendship. And that anytime I do want to talk about race or being a black woman, I always will talk about being a woman of color or I'll say a black woman and then quickly be like, you know, as women of color and try to like relate to you over that. I think when a friendship starts and for a long time, like I feel like we've kind of always talked about race sort of, but like never explicitly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 20 just made everything just so much more explicit. I think I was just nervous. Like, I want to make sure that we feel connected and like bringing up anything where I experience something that you don't. I just am nervous that you, I think I was nervous that you wouldn't respond well to it. And you did respond well to it. <laughs> and you were just like, I mean, and ever since then, I feel like we've been able to talk about race a lot more in our friendship and like what our expectations are of each other and how we can support each other. Yeah. I don't remember how I responded, but I do remember being like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you told me. Yeah. And I had no idea. But it was interesting because I think now this is rejogging my memory. Earlier in that conversation, you were telling me about like, basically about money stuff, about like, as you're moving to consulting, like asking for rates and things like that. But I do remember now that you kept saying the phrase, like as women of color, we are often blah, blah, blah. As women of color, we're often blah, blah, blah. And then later you're like, like that whole story, like I just wanted to say as a black woman, but like, I just wanted to make sure you could relate to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot about that. Yeah, and I don't know why. I mean, I feel like there's nothing that you've ever done that made me feel that way. So I, that's for me a learning that so much of it was just in my head of ways that even in intimate friendships, I'm not like showing up in my full self and saying what I want to be because I'm, I think, just afraid of like further isolating myself or having an experience where someone doesn't like actually hold me in that. And I feel like you've continued to hold me and I feel like I, you as well through things that we both can relate to and can't relate to. And I think that yeah. is part of being a friend, right? Like, I don't need to know, I don't need to relate to everything that you're going through, but I need to know how to like support you and be there for you and also understand like, when can I show up better? And I feel like I've had those moments recently with you around, I feel like I need to do better to show up for the Asian American community. And I don't feel like I've done a great job of that. And I think there's been so many conversations and like through, whether it's through talking with you while you sit in the bathtub or <laughs> Instagram where I'm just like, yeah, like that is a part of me being a better friend for you and just a better human. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I get it though. Like, like if I'm talking to someone who's not Asian about being an Asian woman, it's probably easier to go to the common denominator of where we can relate because yeah. if I call it out would that make the other person feel like now they have to defend what or question is that really the reason why or whatever I don't know like it's like it, it could invite unnecessary things so I do realize that that could be scary so I'm glad you said something to me and that we were able to go there I'm glad you asked I feel like I've after that conversation, I was just like, oh, I want to do this with all of my friends. And then I proceeded to do it with none of them. <laughs> but, Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> but I was just like, this is, it feels weird. And it felt weird. And afterwards, it felt great. And I told so many people about it. One time when we were talking, you were telling me about how sometimes you find yourself in the role of friendships of being like the supporter friend or like the giving advice friend. And that's something that like, you're looking to be like also like one that like asks for help or whatever in friendships. Like, yeah. can you talk more about like, well, how did you even realize that that happened to be the role that you found yourself in in friends? 
I think it kind of even ties back to that emotionless piece. I got, so I, when you were sharing with me during our Panera standoff, not to keep bringing that back up, around how you felt <laughs> like I didn't have those emotions, that like was really triggering to me to like experiences that I had had in college where like close friends were like, oh, had, had said that to me in like a complimentary way, right? Like, oh, like nothing gets past you, like mm. all that. And I think it always hurt me, but I never really could articulate why. And I think because I always played this role in friendships of like never sharing when I was like actually going through it. And like, I wasn't vulnerable in that way. And I never allowed people to see me in those moments of like my lows, only in my highs. And I did that as in like a defensive way by like always showing up for others. And so like, it felt like this weird thing where I'm like, oh, this is a strength of mine that I'm always like listening and giving advice and whatever. But actually it, kind of feels like a defense mechanism Mm -hmm. and like a way of like distancing myself from actually from others and not opening up. I do think that the group therapy was one incident. And I think other other like group experiences that I've had where I just noticed that in myself where I'm like thinking something, but I don't share it. So I'm practicing that. I'm working on like showing up. And I know like a couple weeks ago when I was having a low moment and like spiraling for days and I called you and I was just like telling you how shitty I felt about myself and crying to you on the phone. Like I'm crying in general is not, is like allowing myself to cry more is kind of a new practice, but also with another person that was a very intimate moment. Right? That might have been the only time I have seen you cry. And then I said, I want to be in bed with you. And then you freaked <laughs> out. I laughed. Which is also a very jetty thing during deep, intense moments. <laughs> the most random joke ever. But you know, I'm, I'm trying to be better in that way. Does it ever make you feel like upset at your friends? Like, I wish they knew and it's their fault that they don't know? Yes. <laughs> well, I was like that until like literally like two months ago. <laughs> and then I think I hold that that grudge and then I have like a blow up moment where I'm just like, this is always what you're like. I'm always the person that's like enduring and like taking these things on. And I feel like that has I don't know where it's, I'm sure I could figure out where it stems from, but I think that was so much of how I operated. Mm. And then I feel like I'm always the person receiving other people's on top of the one that I'm already carrying. And then I get upset that they're like, they never ask me like how I'm doing or they never pry when they can tell that I'm really upset. And like, I feel like I did a values judgment on that person of like, you don't care about me enough you never show up for me and I'm always showing up for you. And then I start to have that little like Scorpio grudge in me. I need to take agency and exercise my agency in my friendships. And so instead of waiting for someone to ask me how I'm doing, I'm just gonna tell them. (laughs) And if I ask someone a question and they don't ask it back and I wanna share, I'm just gonna share. And I'm gonna like exercise my agency to just share what I wanna share and to have the experience that I wanna have because I don't need someone else's permission to do it. Oof. Oof. That's so true. I think I can relate with that. And I want to feel empowered to do that more too. Do you feel like your friends have responded well when you've tried that? I remember explicitly like (laughs) testing it out one week where I was just like, I was having a tough time. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to call this person. And I know they're going to share like a lot about their life. They're very forthcoming and I'm not a forthcoming person. And then I was like, I'm gonna practice, instead of hanging up the phone and being like, oh, they didn't ask me about my life. I'm gonna practice actually doing it. I got support from her in that moment. And I feel like that was also a lesson for me that I think I don't share because I don't, I'm afraid that the people won't support me. Mm. Um, And then I shared and it was just a very natural response of someone that I care about and that cares about me just supporting me in a number of ways. My last question for you, which I'm excited about. I know the answer to it, but I love when you talk about it. If you could have any job in the world, there's no obstacles, what would you be doing? So I think I would be doing a version of what I'm doing right now. The first is being an artist. And I think I've mainly identified and like done writing. 
and I want to continue to write and write more. And also I wanna get into film and I wanna direct. I mean, maybe I'll get into a little acting, but I mainly wanna <laughs> direct. Second bucket is donor organizing. I got into fundraising in a really weird sort of happenstance way. I didn't even know what it was at the time or that it was such a big industry and got into what it looks like to move money for grassroots organizations that are fighting for racial justice and social justice and economic justice. And I think that's something that I realize I'm passionate about. And that's something that I can use my class privilege to be moving money and resources to those who are leading these movements to for uh, collective liberation. So that's like that second bucket of donor organizing. And then the third bucket is around policy. So I'm doing some policy work right now uh, that is in the uh, equity and racial justice space. And I think I do like being in it, in the work and like doing like working at, for an organization, a grassroots organization. And I like being at the systems level of it and thinking about how do we create an ecosystem or an infrastructure so that more of these organizations can exist and sprout and grow. I'm doing a little bit of all three right now and I wanna be doing more of those. So that's my dream job. I feel really fulfilled right now. I feel like maybe <laughs> I would shift my percentages on each of them a little bit, but in terms of the conversations I have every day, like there's no, I would choose nothing else. Oh my gosh. I'm so always inspired by you, always impressed with what you're doing. And I love learning about all areas of your work and your life. And not only because you are someone that is like really wise that people go to for advice and whatnot, but also because of like every layer of who you are, including when you're crying in your bed is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs>